you go on what is called a location search, where they bring you, where somebody who's involved, uh, uh, you say, I need a dentist building, but so they, they, this person knows the area extremely well, and says, okay, here's uh, the thing you asked for, this empty building you asked for, here's it, the empty building that, that I think might suit you, and then they take the director in, and the director looks and sees whether it fits what he imagined the scene that's going to be uh, staged there, if it fits his imagination. So I go in, and it's this large building, yeah, that's terrific, it's empty, but it wasn't empty. It was filled with homeless who had laid their cardboard beds, you know, the, the piece of cardboard that they were sleeping on. And they had no place to go to the bathroom, so they would go to the bathroom on the wall. So this whole building was filled with poverty-stricken people who had no place to go to relieve themselves, relieve themselves on the floor. And I could feel the anguish in the floor coming through my running shoes. Uh, it was more than anguish. I could feel it in all the stuff that was lying on the floor <laughs> coming through my soul. And I had I to get on that because it was like permeating my body. I felt the same thing in old theaters. I felt the existence of, you know, you can call them ghosts, but, but the electrons, the, 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 the spirit of the actors who had trod those magic forms, I could feel the emanation from the four forms. And I was saying that at the Grand Ole Opry, all those people who, uh, who had died, maybe a, a great deficit. I, I could feel it. I was standing on the wood, and, I was, and they're all, and they're mesmerized, because these are people who love, who love kind of people. Hi, Johnny Cash. Hi, Jeff. Hi. There goes Johnny. Didn't get a laugh there either. I didn't say <laughs> They were kind of stunned that I could do that. But, uh, but coming off the floorboards of an old theater, being in an old theater where the greats were burlesque and, and vaudeville, and it became a movie house that was back to the stage, uh, those things are all over the country where touring groups in the early 1900s, late 1800s toured. It, that begat equity, the union for stage actors. The producers would send out uh, to uh, uh, Montana, to Casper, Wyoming. They'd send a, they'd send a, a movie, a, a, a stage come down. There's a great theater in Casper, Wyoming. You should make a lot of money. Nobody comes in Casper, Wyoming. So they say, OK, that's it get back if you can. So there'd be the movie company, the theater company, would be stuck in Casper, Wyoming. They'd have to get back to New York themselves. Eventually, equity evolved to get trained there to get the actors back to this back to Earth. Because you don't want to be in Casper, Wyoming. <laughs> He's saying that because that's where I had my first job. That's where I met my wife. But we moved here. Ohio. And, and, and if you had to do it all over again, Tony, would you go back? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, absolutely. Good start. Just don't get stuck. <laughs> well, let's talk about you know the Wild West and, and down south. And you, you were into horses, dogs and horses. Right. I'm, I, I'm, I've had dogs on my adult life. When I could afford it, I, I started the uh, uh, horses. And so horses and dogs are uh, a, a huge huge part of my life. Something very, very if something tragic happens to me, uh, I go to the animals. Uh, I, I, I had a terrible tragedy uh, some years ago. First thing I did was drive over where my horses were, get on a horse, and weep for three days. I, I would get on a horse and seek comfort there. And my dogs bring me uh, great comfort. Uh, I I uh, I read uh, Dobermans uh, from time to time. I had a, uh, a Doberman in Westminster long, many many years ago called Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we almost won the Classic Judgment. Uh, oh, yeah, 
pointing at me, and, and I'm, well, I'm leaving over there. So we came in second, which is like not being there. <laughs> and recently, um, I, 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 I have a, had a, a beautiful, uh, her father was uh, Starbuck, and we started naming the puppies that Starbuck we get uh, from coffee, coffee drinks. So uh, uh, we kept espresso, and uh, espresso, beautiful female, a bitch, and another uh, uh, Close your eyes. <laughs> so, so a month of breeze of this dog, Starbuck, 15 years, died. His, his daughter, uh, Cappuccino, died. Uh, old age, 10 years, he was 15, and his daughter was 10, and we buried them and wailed over the trees. And then, uh, so now espresso is like breathe. It's time to breathe her because. I and she, she needs a companion, and I need a male but I need a stud So, I, and I knew the universe wanted me to have a stud dog, and, and espresso was going to give me some empowering just the way. Stud dog, uh, Trevor, Dr. Trevor Miller, I want you to remember that name. Um, I had the stud dog, and we bred her. And, uh, and then we uh, sounded the, you know, all the sound of uh, uh, her at six or seven or eight weeks, whatever it is, and no luck, she had absorbed. The universe wants me to have a male puppy, Gregory Gay, same dog. And then the other sound, flash of crown, she's got a buddy! Now let her! I'm going to take the best male dog up. There's usually a seven, eight, nine. We have nine puppies. Nine little guys running around. And, and the best male, I've got the unit. And we take her in because she's not delivering. And the, the vet says, mm -hmm, we better do a cesarean, do a cesarean. And there, lying in her tummy, I was there. I was matching was there. There, lying in her tummy, is the gigantic male puppy, a single one. One puppy, dead, was still born. And it was then I realized the universe, the universe didn't give a shit. <laughs> the universe couldn't care less if I had a male dog. The universe could care less about anything. The universe was going on without me having a male dog. So then I bought a puppy from Dr. Trevor Miller, who lives in Moore Park, California. I bought a male puppy. He'd become a friend of And so Trevor sold me the best puppy. The puppy spoke. I saw the puppy, the puppy saw me, nine puppy. I say, that's the puppy, he says, that's the best puppy in the world. I know, puppy's telling me. <laughs> bye bye, and we, we named him, he was the nine name, it's Machia. Machia. Mac. Mac turns out to be a freak. He is, there's one, four classes in two shows side by side. He's got seven points towards his championship. He's only nine months old. He's gigantic. He's a great dog. I'm at the dog show with Macchiato. Espresso is at home, and she gets into some chocolate. Chocolate's a poison. And she dies. In a oh, 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 man. Suddenly she has a heart attack, and my beloved Espresso dies. Now, I'm without espresso, but Macchiato is without his mother, his friend, his lover, the, everything that this nine-month-old puppy loved to play with was gone. So I, I called Trevor, and I said, Trevor, I need a puppy, but I can't be eight weeks old. I don't have time to, to mold a puppy, and, and uh, the Macchiato might eat it. I need, I need a six-month-old puppy. And he says, I've got a puppy from my previous letter. I got a puppy. I drive up there, and he shows me the puppy. The puppy's a little shy. It's a kennel dog. I don't have time to fix that dog. But over there, litter sister to that dog is a great puppy, old and female. 
I need that dollar, so I can't sell you that dollar. I'm, I'm keeping it. I said, Trevor, I need that dollar, so I can't sell it to you. Trevor! <laughs> I need that. He goes, Bill, I, I don't think he's beginning to soften. Now, I've told you this because I want you all to get a hold of Dr. Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> Moorpark, Moor Park, California. <laughs> Dr. Trevor and tell him, get, give Bill, sell Bill that puppet because he's thinking about it. You've got to help me get that puppet. <laughs> You're very persuasive. I'm going to look this guy up. Well, I hope that all works out for you. Uh, I have a, there's a question here that I guess it's kind of related to horseback riding, but somebody may have to explain this. this is from Tom K. in Toledo. How was your experience on the Segway in the Weird or What episode? Segway? Uh, you know, the Segways are a miracle. They're, there's all these uh, gyroscopes balancing everything. And uh, the guy who invented the Segway, his ambition was to get cars out of the city streets and put people going back and forth on the Segway. So I rode the Segway, which goes pretty fast, uh, all over the place, and it really works, except it's too expensive. So what I did was, I said, I've got to get an electric bicycle, because I love the bicycle, but you know the feeling, and, and, and it, it, it increases as you get older. The feeling when you ride somewhere and you're full of joy, look at the sun and the road, it's great. And you go and they say, that's great. Oh my God, I gotta turn around and bicycle <laughs> back. You know, now the winds are against you and it's cold. And you know, all you have to do on an electric bike, and you've got electric power, you can either pedal along or just sit there and go like a motorcycle. So I'm doing pedago bikes. They're incredible. I've got 15 people in my immediate family in California. We've all got pedigree, and we go bicycling all the time. The front family together. It's incredible. You can take the 13-year-old grandchildren and the old guy, and I can stay up with those 13-year-olds. All on an electric bike, so I urge you to look at pedigree. That's my, uh, my That's experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can take him down to the vet's office and, and the whole family can shake him down. <laughs> Give us the dog. <laughs> Who's your favorite co-star in the Star Trek series? Well, uh, my favorite co-star in Star Trek. I wrote a book on Leonard. Called Leonard. Uh, he's a marvelous guy. Uh, really, uh, the brother I never had. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm a, a, in show business everywhere. Movies, plays, series, thin, long-term things. The, the cast gets together. They're bonded by this effort to make entertainment that is so precarious. You don't know whether you're doing well or not until you open. So you present in front of an audience. You don't know for sure whether you've got anything good or not. That's the most miraculous thing until you View it and laugh in the places you're supposed to laugh and laugh in places where you're not supposed to laugh. I mean, whatever you, the audience, do, it's pretty much a cohesive group, which is why this is so much better than looking at television alone. This group experience is what we're supposed to We're programmed for this group experience. The cast unites. They feel a, a, a brotherhood. The instant it's over, with very rare exceptions, People say, I love you, God. It's great being on stage today. I'll call you tomorrow. No, 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 I, I, I can't call you tomorrow. I got another appointment. I'll call you the day after. No, I can't call you the day after tomorrow, but I'll, I'll call you. And I never call you because you get busy, I get busy. So uh, James Spader, whom I love, spent five years with James Spader. <laughs> Since Boston Legal stopped, I hadn't spoken twice on the phone, but I hadn't spoken. Just too busy going. Our ways, but with Leonard doing stage stuff, going to uh, Comic Cons, being in a car with him, realizing how much we had in common. Instead of after the three years was over and we all went our way, all the movies we made, all the appearances we made, we became 
this this brother, these uh, brother, closest of brothers. Uh, so I love him, but I'll tell you that uh, that uh, uh, McCoy uh, uh, divorced. <laughs> Forrest Kelly was the essence of a Southern gentleman. And I, 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 so that, I want to tell you uh, 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 the story of, uh, which re would reflect my relationship with uh, DeForest. I used to be a hunter. I used to hunt with Bonner. I got pretty good at it. I was at Cobo Hall in Detroit. I competed with uh, uh, Bow and Arrow. And then in those years, many, many years ago, go hunting. So I would hunt with a Bow and Arrow. And you had to stop. The, uh, the game. So you could see the game. And you have your bow and your arrow notch. And you had to be very, very careful. You had to be alert to what the game was There it is. Move over here. Keep your eye on the game. You educated yourself as a bow hunter. And I stopped hunting many, many years ago. I had a gnat. I, I worship life. I don't want anything to die. I had a gnat in the car the other day. I was going, oh, why should I kill the gnat? <laughs> Let the little gnat live. <laughs> so I rolled down the window and the gnat did. And I thought, hmm, that killed the gnat there. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't want to take any life anymore, but that eye has remained. So there. In making Star Trek, they would have to take film and breakfast goodies, all kinds of eggs, bagel, and I would watch people come in and eat. I watched the forest come in. Well, he came in and would eat. You know, he'd come in. He'd go for the bagels. Southern gentleman goes over the bagels. He'd cut a bagel. You know. Then he put the bagel in the toaster. You know, you could tell how much he was going to get you. <laughs> I see uh, Leonard. I said, Leonard, distract D. You see, the forest, in these nights that we would shoot, late at night, uh, we'd shoot sometimes, start at 6 o'clock in the evening, go to 6 o'clock in the morning, and at late at night, tend to reveal yourself, you know? <laughs> and the first would talk to me, you know, and he sometimes, one time he said, you know, Bill, I think I'm busy with mine. I can't remember the words of the thing. I don't, I don't remember my word. God, I don't remember my word. I said, no, oh, Dean, don't worry about forgetting it. Not, you're not, everybody forgets where the keys are and guacamole. I can't remember guacamole. <laughs> It, it, it's okay, Dean. Don't worry about forgetting. He would said that to me late at night. So I said to Leonard, distract Dean. So Leonard said, DeForest, I got something in my eye. Would you take a look at me? And when DeForest left the toaster, I popped the toaster, I took the bait, I pressed the toaster back, and I got over here. <laughs> and DeForest comes over to the toaster. And he's reading for it, and he pops up in the snow bagel. <laughs> Damn. I swore to you, but he <laughs> so goes over to the bagel, cuts a bagel out. There's no pleasure in what he's doing now. Now he's at it. <laughs> now he's waiting for the bagel pop up, and I say to Leonard, And then I pop the bagel, and I don't know what to do with it, so I shove it in my mouth. And DeForest comes over here, he's waiting for the bagel, but the bagel pops up, and there's no bagel! He's forgotten to do a bagel, he's looking around, and he sees me choking on the bagel! He's a huge shatter! I said, never mind, get a doctor!
loved him. He didn't speak to me for a week. <laughs> but we love these stories. We absolutely love hearing these stories. Now, before we go, are there any behind the scenes stories during Wrath of Khan that happened on or off set? Well, uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, uh, we, we, every so often, we, we shot in on the stage all the time. I mean, where are you going to go for the, another planet, you know? Uh, so they would move the rocks around and be another planet, but every so often, <laughs> we, would, we would go out to the San Andreas Fault, uh, about 50 miles outside. There was a place called Vasquez Rocks, all these jagged rocks from the, from the, the North American plate and the Pacific plate rubbing up against each other. So there were all these rocks, that's kids' rocks. And it was about 50 miles, and, and, and they said, you know, you have to drive yourself there. So it occurred to me when I said to the producer, listen, uh, you know, we got out there, I've been out there, and it takes a half an hour to the wardrobe on, another half, and you gotta get there so early because the moment the sun rises, you gotta start shooting because you only have that limited period of time. Summer. I said, why don't I take it? Why don't I take the Captain Kirk wardrobe? Why don't I take it uh, home tonight, put it on in the morning, and I'll drive to the location and I'll save a half an hour. I'll be able to sleep in, you know, I'll be, I'll be ahead. He says, that's a good idea. I don't know why anybody hasn't thought. Take the wardrobe home. And, and wear it to the set. So, four o'clock in the morning, morning, I put on the, on the wardrobe, and I get in the car, and I start driving towards Vasquez Rock. Now, I drive fast, okay? <laughs> I've regaled you with the story of me going 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour is about my speed. <laughs> so, uh, what? Move to Michigan. Move to Michigan. <laughs> I've been all over the country driving fast. Slow in, fast out. I'm driving. Limits of adhesion. Danny McCarty would say, because he'd have a weekend before the race where any, uh, all the celebrities who wanted to race would have to go there to take the lessons. His, his thing was one of the flags, yellow flag, red flag, white flag, checker flag, all the flag. Watch the flag. And gentlemen, and especially you from Michigan, <laughs> if something happens to the car, stay in the car. Stay in the car. Did you hear me? Stay in the car. If something happens to the car, little girl. <laughs> stay in the car. I'm in the road race. I'm driving. The straightaway. The straightaway is 125 miles an hour. Down there. Now there's a, a right hand turn. So, so, you gotta apply the brakes judiciously. If you apply them too soon, you slow down, and people pass you, so you don't want to do that. If you don't put them on in time, you carry too much speed, the, and you turn your wheel, the front wheels scrub, and you go in a straight line. Donnie Osmond did that, right? Carried too much speed, ran up a flagpole, and came crashing down. And Dan McCarty said, here's the film on Donnie Osmond, don't do that. So now I'm in my car, driving fast, in the, in the, in the Long Beach, and suddenly something explodes, and the car can't, the car, the, the, the car starts smoking. 
And people are running for it. Oh, 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 oh. I said, it's okay, I'm taking it. No, no, it's not going to get bad. I'm it. What? Get everything out. I'm staying in the car. No, you idiot. The car's on fire. <laughs> get out of the car. So I got out of the car. Now, I know how to drive fast. I was in Nashville, North Carolina. Exactly the opposite. Okay? Exactly the opposite from Nashville. They got a dam on the back of the trunk. And the air comes over the trunk, over the, over the hood, that, and presses down on the dam. So the rear end is hugging the road. The faster you go, the more it sticks. It's counterintuitive to what Danny McCarty would do. In NASCAR, you go fast in and faster out. I couldn't do that. The competition was there were three people in the car. There were several cars, several celebrities competing to be in the race. And, but there were three people in the car, so one person had to leave. It was the person who went the slowest. At this point, I had the uh, the coach of the uh, Pittsburgh guy does the color with the mustache. Uh, Keller, Bill Keller, Bill Keller, and and Laird Hamilton's wife, the beautiful long, uh, great athlete. Anyway, two <laughs> great athletes and me. Okay? And one had gone 192 miles an hour and another had gone 187 miles an hour. I had to go faster than one of them. I had to get faster than 192 miles an hour. And, and, and I was going around and I couldn't get, I, I kept going slow in and fast out. Finally, on my last attempt, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do it. So, I, I, I studied karate. I know about the key, you know. Ah! <laughs> Release your key. So as I came to this curb, I pressed down on the accelerator. I had to go faster than 192 miles an hour, and I released my key. Now there are cameras because they were filming. So when they released the show, I saw me releasing my key. And here's what I saw. I know how to drive fast, okay? So now I'm driving fast to, to the Vasquez Rocks. And then I see my rearview mirror cop. <laughs> oh, Lord. I pull over, and he comes over. Now, the California police, the chips, highway police, they're, they're leading men. They're all leading men. They all do movies. <laughs> they, they're six foot two, built like that. And, and they wear that great hat, the shirt, the thing. And they wear sunglasses at night. <laughs> and he comes over to me, and he says, let me see your license. I hand him my license. He says, get out of the car. Get out of the car. Get out of the car, and I realize, I'm wearing Captain Kirk's suit. <laughs> get out of my face. And he's looking at me with the sunglasses. I don't know what's going on behind the side. He looks at me, and he looks at the side. And finally, he hands me my license, and he walks towards his patrol car. I get my license. <laughs> and I'm dying of curiosity to see what's behind those, those sunglasses. But I don't want to turn, and that's guilty. You know, imagine you go like this, they say, you're under arrest because you look guilty. So I turn with dignity, like, you know, I'm not. I wasn't going to hunt past an hour. What's up? What's your problem? <laughs> and he's looking. Gives me a Vulcan salute and says, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs>